Hey everyone, how's it going? My name's Ben, welcome back to the channel. Today we're talking about planning your very first overland trips and sharing some of the tips I wish I knew when I was just starting out. But first, let's grab some coffee. So here's the thing, not too long ago I put out a video called How to Start Overlanding on a Budget. If you haven't seen it yet, I'll link it somewhere up here. But one thing I heard from a lot of you folks after posting that video was questions looking for just more detail on how I started planning my first trips, if I've got any tips or tricks or anything like that. So that's what we're doing today. Let's get right into it. So if you really wanna know the truth, my single biggest piece of advice for people planning their first overlanding trip is actually fairly simple. Find a friend with more experience overlanding than you who also likes to plan and just tag along with them. I really think there's a ton of value in doing this for your first few trips. I actually like to joke that overlanding is a team sport, even though for me and, and probably for many of you, the ultimate goal is to get out someplace remote and isolate ourselves and leave everyone else behind. I think of it as a team sport because one of the best ways to learn and grow and get better at it is by surrounding ourselves with people who have been doing it for longer. But here's the thing, when I was first starting out, I didn't have a friend group that was already off-roading and overlanding. I didn't know where to find these people that I could learn from. But over time, I realized that one of the best places to find people that you can learn from is through these online communities. There are vehicle-specific forums, overlanding-specific forums, where you can actually connect with people and learn about your local area. One great example of this is toyota4runner.org. It's a place where I spend a ton of time learning how to wrench on my truck and what mods to do, but they actually have location-specific sub-forums where you can find trail reports or group trips or generally just meet some other folks in your area and the rigs that they drive. So I would highly recommend checking online communities for your specific vehicle or your specific area. Another great place I found to meet folks is through events and meetups. There are obviously huge opportunities to do this at places like Overland Expo or SEMA, these sort of national level events, but you might also be able to find smaller events right in your area. Things like a Saturday morning cars and coffee at your local 4x4 shop or something like that. I typically keep an eye out for these just by searching on social media or on Google. Uh, oftentimes it'll be your local off-roading club or overlanding club or vehicle specific club, maybe it's the Land Rover Club or, or something like that, that put on these types of events. So do some searching, figure out what's in your area and show up. It's, it's a great way to, to rub shoulders and, and find people that are organizing some of these group trips. So my final tip here is to simply take a closer look at the cars around you in parking lots. Whether it's the grocery store or at work or anywhere in between, uh, the max tracks and rooftop tents and jerry cans are practically smoke signals for finding like-minded people. Now, you've got to be careful not to be creepy about it, but you may be able to seize an opportunity as your paths cross to say hi and you know, exchange contact information. I actually just had this happen to me not too long ago as I pulled into the parking lot of our favorite pizza and beer spot to grab some takeout. There was this totally built out Tacoma parked right up front and it turns out that it belonged to one of the bartenders there. We got to chatting and I just said, hey man, it'd be awesome to get out and hit some trails sometime. Are you on Instagram or something so we could connect? And it was as simple as that. Now. In the future, if he's got a trip coming up or if I've got a trip, we can reach out to each other and share the knowledge. So keep that in mind. 
So heading out on group trips your first couple of times on the trail will give you some great experience. It'll help build confidence in your vehicle and what it's capable of, as well as start to build your own intuition for things like the difficulty level of trails, how many miles you want to plan to drive in a day, what to look for in campsites and where to camp, and so much more. Inevitably, it'll also expose you to a ton of cool gear people own and a ton of different mods that you can think about for your own rig. Group trips can be a dangerous thing for, for the wallet, that's for sure. And here's the thing, you really shouldn't be pushing your limits or finding out what your vehicle is capable of or what you're capable of as a driver without other people around. Play it smart, use your common sense, and learn from people with more experience than you. All right, with that said, let's plan a trip. There's some key questions to answer here when you're planning your first trip, or any trip really. Where should I go? What trails do I wanna take? Where should I camp? There's a bunch of great resources that we'll get into today, but one of the biggest ones that I rely on heavily is Gaia GPS. I've got the app on my cell phone and iPad, and I've got it bookmarked on my computer. That way, if I'm scrolling through Instagram or watching some YouTube videos and see a place I want to explore in the future, I can make a note of it, drop a pin in the app or, or on the website, and it's these pins along with the notes app on my cell phone where I'll jot down a quick reminder if a buddy tells me about an awesome spot he's been to that all serve as my inspiration list for when I sit down at the table to start planning a trip. So my second biggest resource when it comes to planning trips, and I've talked about them before, but it's trail guides like these. Uh, the Fun Treks ones, I think, cover most of the Western United States, but oftentimes if you search on Google or Amazon, you can find a uh, back roads or trail guide for your local area as well. And I would highly recommend finding these books or something similar if you're just starting out. So I like these Fun Treks trail guides specifically because they've got a very clear rating system for the trails. They tell you what to expect and they give you really easy to follow waypoints and references for when you're out on the trail. In addition to these trail guides, there are also great websites out there. Two specifically that I use a lot are trailsoffroad.com and alltrails.com. These are great for researching what's available in different areas, as well as getting more up-to-date sort of trail reports from people because you'll log in and people will comment and leave pictures and things like that. They're both free resources. I think you do have to you know, sign up and, and make an account, but I would highly recommend those websites as well. So when I'm planning my trips, the very first thing I take into account is how much time I'm gonna have. Is it gonna be a quick overnighter, leaving Saturday morning, coming home Sunday night, or maybe I'm gonna cash in some vacation days and make it a week-long trip, or who knows, maybe you caught the stomach flu and end up taking Friday off to make it a three-day weekend. Hey, I'm not here to judge. I do think my boss watches these though, so I would never do that. Uh, given how much time I've got for a trip though, I've developed a personal rule of thumb that works for me to determine my search radius for where I want to go. Over time, you'll figure out what works for you, I'm sure. If it's a quick overnight trip, I want to keep it within about two to three hours of my house. If it's a three-day weekend, now we're sort of expanding the search radius to that six to eight hour drive time maybe. And for a week-long trip, we're sort of solidly into road trip territory where we're maybe covering multiple states or some really long trail systems. And now with my search radius set, I'm starting to pull out my resources. I'm opening up Gaia GPS and looking at my pins, uh, reading through my notes app and seeing if there's anything that jumps out at me. Is there anything online, anything new on all trails or, or something like that that I wanna check out? And if I'm being honest, this is usually the extent of my research. I'll typically find a spot from these resources and pack up the rig and head out. But sometimes it's not that easy and it may require a little bit more effort on your part. Sometimes I realize that I heard about a spot and just dropped a pin in the general area with no other real details to go on. So when this happens, I typically find myself dealing with three types of public lands. National Park Service land, Forest Service land, and BLM land. Now, national parks are pretty straightforward. These are the places like Yellowstone, Yosemite, Arches, and you've got to go camp at these places at some point in your life. I mean, they're national parks for a reason. Largely, I feel like they're tourist traps maybe and typically don't offer a ton of off-roading or overlanding, but there are certainly exceptions. You can definitely find backcountry trails or trails that require high clearance and four by fours 
you'll likely still be able to only camp in designated spots that may require permits or reservations, but these backcountry trails in our national parks can certainly get you off the beaten path and away from the crowds. And again, hey, they're national parks for a reason. Now, Forest Service land is controlled by the U.S. Department of Agriculture and was created to support and maintain the diversity of America's grasslands and forests. At least, that's what Wikipedia told me. I spend a ton of time on Forest Service land because of really two main things. The first is the huge network of Forest Service roads and the ability to disperse camp. Forest Service roads are typically marked and numbered on maps, and the maps you really want to look for are called multi-vehicle use maps, or the MVUM. Ranger districts put out these maps to show you uh, which Forest Service roads are, are open and, and legal for what type of access, so you'll definitely want those as a resource. Dispersed camping, of course, is the ability to take one of these Forest Service roads out, find a clearing, and set up camp. There's no services or amenities, but hey, that's what we're after, right? So of course, anytime you're dispersed camping, be sure to read up on and practice Leave No Trace principles so that everyone gets a chance to enjoy these places. It's also important to understand the local do's and don'ts. Things like seasonal closures or other restrictions can typically be found online at the Forest Service Ranger District that you'll be going to, but this is also a great opportunity to simply stop in at the ranger station and ask questions. No one knows these Forest Service lands better than the rangers who work there. And so finally, that brings us to Bureau of Land Management or BLM land. I like to think of BLM land like the wild west of public lands. If you have some form of recreation in mind, chances are you can do it on BLM land. It's truly multi-purpose. Shooting, off-roading, mountain biking, camping, you name it, you can probably do it. Be sure to check out any local regulations online, use common sense, and again, leave no trace is critically important. BLM land can get us to some seriously remote places, and we've got to treat them with respect. So one really great thing about Gaia GPS, and the reason I have a premium subscription, is that the map overlay feature lets us visualize these public lands. Turning on the public lands layer in Gaia actually shows us the Forest Service land with a green shading and the BLM land in yellow. And you can zoom in to find out what different roads and trails are available within these plots of public lands. Drop pins, set waypoints, and you're off to the races. So at this point in the trip planning, if you're still unsure about where to go, here's my best recommendation. Open up Google Maps, find your nearest national forest, map yourself to the closest ranger station, and pack up your car and go. It's as simple as that. Now, it is worth noting that things like wildfires or other natural disasters could cause our public lands to close, and as we're witnessing right now, things like a coronavirus pandemic can also cause them to close. So pick up the phone and call the ranger station or check the website online just to make sure you know whether or not they're open or any sort of seasonal restrictions that may be in place. All right, so now we know where we're going. The question becomes, what do we need to take with us? And here's the thing. Contrary to the Instagram posts and the YouTube videos showing all the gear under the sun, you really don't need very much. Now, common sense rules do apply here, but over the years, I've built up and refined the kit that works for me to make my camping trips comfortable. You should also be constantly refining your kit. My biggest piece of advice here is to start with what you have, watch what works for others, what doesn't, and that'll really help you build out the kit that works perfect for you. Water, shelter, fire, and food, that's the order of importance for me. It should go without saying, but bring water, more than you think you'll need. So take into account things like dousing your fire or any water you'll need for cooking or cleaning. I'll typically do somewhere right around a gallon per person per day, and then add a couple gallons on top of that just to round it off. This is uh, more water than I'll need, but the peace of mind I think is worth it. I pack all my water in these refillable aqua bricks that you've seen in my videos, and I think they're great. They don't leak, they're strong enough just to get tossed in the back of the rig, and I love having this accessory spigot cap that lets me just throw the, the water container right on our camp table and people can fill their cups or bottles straight from there. So that brings us to shelter, and shelter is really about what works for you. You're car camping, right? We're not ultralight through hikers trying to shave off the ounces, so make it comfortable. 
It could be a Coleman tent and an air mattress from Walmart with some bedding that you stole from home. It could be a rooftop tent like I run, or you know, I even have a buddy that just brings a tarp and a sleeping bag and is happy as can be. Overlanders do typically seem to take shelter to the extreme, practically setting up a Four Seasons hotel complete with climate control. But wherever you fall on the spectrum, the key is make sure it's something that's gonna work for you and it doesn't have to break the bank. All right, so that brings us to fire. If you don't have a campfire, are you really camping? Okay, you probably are. And sometimes fire restrictions mean it's just not an option. But when it is an option, it's important to have a plan. Do you need a fire permit for the area? Are you gonna be able to collect firewood or should you bring your own from home? What about a portable fire pit or is there gonna be a fire ring available? Things like these are great questions to ask. So just think about it and, and again, make sure you've got it planned. And so finally, that brings us to food. This again is gonna be based entirely on personal preference. There are some folks that just wanna have a quick freeze-dried meal they can add hot water to and call it a day. And some people just wanna ball out and bring appetizers and ice cream for dessert and a whole three-course meal in between. Wherever you fall on this spectrum, the thing I really wanna drive home is just that it's important to have a plan. There's nothing worse than being on a trail, thinking about that awesome ribeye you're gonna have for dinner, only to get camp set up and pop the lid to your cooler to realize, I left the steaks at home in the fridge. Been there, done that. All right, so at this point, we know where we're gonna go. We know what we need to bring. That brings us to our final step of preparing our vehicle. This is about more than just packing it up though. Overlanding is of course all about your vehicle. It needs to be able not just to get you out to these remote places, but also bring you home at the end of the trip. Otherwise you end up on Matt's towing and recovery and become the laughing stock of YouTube. And no one wants that. So do a quick vehicle pre-trip inspection before you head out, just to make sure you're starting off on the right foot. You know, crank it over and, and listen for, for anything weird is, does it sound like the battery's struggling to crank your engine? Are there new warning lights on the dashboard? Get out and walk around. Uh, are your lights and blinkers working? Are there any new leaks underneath? And what do your tires look like? Is there some tread left on there? Use your common sense here. And of course, no one knows your vehicle better than you. If it's got that weird noise that it's made for the last decade and you just know it's all reliable, then there's no cause for concern. But if you have any doubt about your vehicle's ability to again get you safely out there and back home, it is far better to postpone the trip till the next weekend and give you a chance to replace those bald tires or fix that radiator that just won't hold cool in anymore. And with that, I think you're hopefully a little bit more prepared to plan and execute your very first overlanding trip than you were before you started watching this video. If you've got any questions, be sure to drop them in the comments below and I'll get right back to you. I am super excited to announce that not only did we just pass 1,000 subscribers, which absolutely blows me away, I'm so thankful for each and every one of you, but we also just launched our brand new website, ouradventureoverland.com. I'll link it in the description below. Over there, you'll be able to find the packing checklist that I personally use before I head out on a trip, completely free for you to download and use yourself. Hopefully you'll be able to avoid forgetting the steaks in the fridge at home that way. We've also got some shirts, hats, and stickers over there to help you gear up for your next adventure. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, it'd be a huge help to give it that thumbs up. And if you're new here, consider subscribing and sticking around. We've got some great stuff on the way that I'm excited to share with you all. Until next time though, get out and explore somewhere.